And now, without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mori, and I would ask that you give him a good, warm, Southbridge Sturbridge Charlton welcome this evening, Dr. Mori. Glad to see some new faces this evening. I can, with coverture prayers as we continue to fight laryngitis. Uh, yesterday, I didn't think I'd make it through last night. We did. <clears throat> I'm still up here coughing and carrying on, but we're going to make it through tonight. <clears throat> Clear up my throat a little bit. And then tomorrow evening, we will be dealing with the subject of the restoration movement of the 19th century and the disciples of Christ, the, the Church of Christ, and the Christian Church, uh, these denominations which came out of that restoration movement. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time this evening. Father, we thank you that we have nothing to fear from the evil one. That the Lord Jesus conquered him when he hung on the cross, for he spoiled principalities and powers. He made an open show of them publicly, triumphing over them by the cross. What Satan thought was his moment of victory became the moment of his defeat. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities and powers of things visible and invisible, and that we, because of our saving union with you, are also seated in the heavenly, and thus we have authority over the demonic forces. And through the name and through the blood that was shed on Calvary, through your name, Lord Jesus, we go forth to conquer the kingdom of darkness, to take the slaves of Satan and to usher them into the kingdom which you purchased with your own blood. Now bind the powers of darkness and sin. Enable us, Lord, to understand the times in which we live, that we may better evangelize, that we may better protect our own family from those evil forces. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please turn with me and I hope you brought your Bible this evening, you do need it, to the book of Ephesians, which is one of the most wonderful books in the New Testament. And in the book of Ephesians, which has a twofold division of doctrinal and then practical material, we are told in chapter 6, <clears throat> beginning at verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. One of the things that is often mistaken for the motivation behind counter-cult ministries is the idea that, well, uh, these people just don't like Mormons. They, they're being mean to those involved in the cults and they're being nasty to the Jehovah's Witnesses or to other groups. And actually, those who are involved in dealing with the cults and the occult do not do so because they hate people, regardless of what religious organization uh, they may belong but they do so because they love people, but they hate the evil one who has captured them in a system of darkness. Here the Apostle Paul said, we must remind ourselves that as we are engaged in a spiritual battle in this life, we are not fighting simply against an enemy that is composed of flesh and blood, that is an enemy that is mortal that is simply human. Your enemy is not the Jehovah's Witness standing on the corner. He is the victim of the evil one. Your enemy is not the Mormon missionary who comes and knocks on your door. The enemy is not the person involved in the occult, in the New Age channeling, or other of the great so-called mysteries of the latter part of the 20th century. Our enemy is the arch enemy of the souls of men, the one that the scripture refers to as Satan, the devil, the serpent, 
the dragon, Lucifer, the prince of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, the wise and cunning one who does what he can to deceive men into believing that which is erroneous in order to keep them from believing that which is the truth unto the saving of the soul. As we approach the subject of the occult and parapsychology, the New Age movement, ESP, uh, paranormal experimentations, we do not have any malice toward those who are playing with Ouija boards, who are fingering their crystals as they're at some business meeting hoping this will work. We have no malice toward the victims of Satan's campaign of darkness. We love them, and we tell them the truth in the hopes that God, through His Spirit, may bring them to repentance, to an acknowledgement of the truth, that they may be recovered out of the snare of the evil one. Now tonight we will be dealing with the subject of the occult, and today the occult is usually referred to as parapsychology, ESP, or the New Age movement, or psychic powers or the hidden powers of the mind, or the in, inner powers of the psyche or soul. First of all, in terms of a basic definition of terms, <clears throat> the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, which simply means that which is hidden or unseen. Now, during the Middle Ages, because of the triumph of Christianity over a pagan Western civilization, Certain practices were outlawed because the Bible saw them as an abomination unto God. Thus it became illegal to be engaged in certain occultic arts which the pagans had always been involved in, such as divination and the attempt to discover the answer or the future by supernatural means. Now this can be by reading signs saying there was an owl or looking at the flight of birds or they would kill an animal and open it up and study the liver or the kidney or you have the witch doctor in his feather headdress throwing some bones on the ground or someone reading tea leaves or looking at the stars in terms of astrology all of these occultic arts were condemned as illegal as well as blasphemous and thus if you wanted to get involved in the occultic arts you did so hidden and unseen from the civil authority. So the word occultist began to take on the connotation of those hidden criminal acts which not only violated what the scriptures and Christianity and historic Judaism stood against, but also the laws of Western society. It is a remarkable fact that most of the states still have laws on the books against witchcraft, against, against palm reading, against seances, against the very things that are being tooted and carried on even on the main streets. Coming to Southbridge and driving along to the motel, I observed to the left the sign of the palm reader and the reader of the tarot cards. And you find them all over the place. And of course, as soon as astrology became a little bit more famous because of Nancy Reagan, uh, immediately they put out astrological readings. I didn't have any previous training, but if a sucker can be taken once, he can be taken several times. So we are now dealing today with the occultic arts. It is those things which were previously understood as being part of the rites of the witch doctor, of the pagan, the heathen, being part of sorcery of the supernatural world of Satanism and devilcraft. But you see, in the 19th century, <clears throat> toward the latter part of the century, there was a revival of the occultic arts in the midst of this end-of-the-world mania. And there were those who immediately revived astrology, the theory of reincarnation, the idea of seances and trying to reach the dead, this is when you had people involved in table rapping. You had the Fox sisters in Upper New York who claimed that through playing a game and asking the spirit, they discovered that there was a dead man buried in their basement. 
And when they dug up the basement, they found the dead man buried in the basement. Now, it may have been the case that the girls had been digging in that basement before and had discovered that body and covered it back up and then went upstairs in a little bit more flamboyant way uh, to discover that. There were those who actually believed in fairies, and there was a great photograph that was taken that was declared to be impeachably authentic by Sir Arthur Connor Doyle himself, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series. And there was a movement that began first in England and in this country that culminated in the creation of the Society for Psychical Research. Now, this society was very, very uh, well-to-do. It was well-received. It was prestigious because of its membership. No less than two prime ministers of England were members. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as I said, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series, Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland, another book, William James, the famous, famous uh, psychologist, uh, many of the men at Oxford and Cambridge also belonged to the society. In this country, you had notables who were professors at Harvard and Yale and other places. One of the most famous members was uh, Mark Clemens, uh, Samuel Clemens, whom we know as Mark Twain. So the Society for Psychical Research, which was devoted to the study of the occult arts, was composed of some of the most brilliant minds of the 19th century. But they studied it with a difference. <clears throat> and the difference was this. They declared that these feats, such as levitation, walking on coals of fire without being burned, uh, making objects float into the air, or you yourself floating out a window and floating back into a window, uh, the appearance of, of visions and dreams and ghosties and ghoulies and things that go bump in the night, that these things were not to be viewed as evil. No moral judgment was to be given that these things are witchcraft. Instead, for the first time, it was proclaimed that this was simply science. These things were psychic. These things were part of the evolution of the human mind. They were able to combine the theory of evolution from Charles Darwin with the idea of the old pagan witchcraft and sorcery to say man is evolving and he's evolving into a being whose mind is going to be capable of doing things that are absolutely marvelous, unthinkable. And we should study these things not <coughs> as coming from the demonic forces as the superstitious Christians believe, nor as coming from deities and spirits that live in tree trunks as the pagan witch witches believed. Instead, the Christians and the pagans had mistakenly called religious that which was only scientific. It was part of the evolution of man. It was the budding of certain mental abilities. So they said, therefore, we can now get involved in the study of these things in a neutral, objective, and scientific way. And after sifting through case after case after case toward the close of the century, they did have to admit that they had not found a single account where such a so-called psychic feat was proven to be absolutely true and not capable of being a fraud. They were the ones, for example, who exposed Madame Plavatsky, who started the Theosophy religion. Now, she had very funny seances. You would go and get in the room and they'd lower the light <coughs> and you'd sit around the table and, of course, the table would be moving and all of a sudden you'd see a luminous ball in the air. And then a trumpet would be floating around and it would go toot, 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 toot. And then maybe there would be a drum floating in the air and you would hear a drum playing. And then maybe later a white face would appear, just a face with like a veil over it. And the face looked like Auntie M. And she would say, Yeah, how are you, dear? 
And it was fantastic. And it was proclaimed that Madame Blavatsky, the supreme power, the one who would develop these great mental abilities. Well, there was a team of investigators who wanted to check out Madame Blavatsky. And her servant was the one who spoiled the day. I'm, I'm sure he got fired. While they were in the seance room, he said, you'll see that everything here is authentic. There's no way that any of this could uh, be a fraud. Every, the wall is solid. Look, you can see yourself. Uh, you can pound on it anyway, anywhere. And he went and pounded on a panel, and it popped open and revealed the secret closet. And hung up was the ball, the trumpet, the drum, and a black suit so that you couldn't see the person. And then the suit could be, a little patch could be taken out to see the face. And there was like a wedding veil that could be put across. Well, of course, that meant the end of it. By the way, today, there is a revival of interest in the founder of theosophy. <clears throat> they usually fail to tell you about her encounter uh, with those who discovered her fraudulent use of the seance room uh, and her other fraudulent game. But the Society for Psychical Research made going to seances, playing with the Ouija board, using the crystal ball, going to the palm readers, acceptable. That's why you find it in Agatha Christie novels. That's why you find it in the literature of the period. You even had Anglican clergymen going to have his tea leaves read. This is why as you come into the uh, 20th century, you'll have writers who use magic, who will use elements of theosophy, and they weren't doing it deliberately. There really wasn't anyone at that time shouting objections. You find this in Tolkien's works uh, when he deals with the Lord of the Rings. You'll find much use of witchcraft and magic, or even with C.S. Lewis. The nanny who took care of him was an ardent follower of theosophy and Madame Blavatsky. And she used to regale little C.S. Lewis with stories from theosophy. And thus, when you read the Nardia tales, you find out that many of the key individuals are given names that come right out of the theosophy dictionary. And you find many of the themes woven into it. Not that C.S. Lewis was saying, I'm going to go against Christianity by using theosophy, he was simply using the stories, the illustrations. He learned these theosophical stories. He learned when he was a child with um, his English nanny. Now, as we come into the 20th century, there was an immediate break in terms of interest in the occult. And what happened was simply this. Everyone was saying the end of the world would happen at the end of the century. Now, they said the same thing at the end of the 17th century, the end of the 16th century. Matter of fact, the most chaotic time in Europe was the year 999. Because they said the year 1000 will complete 6,000 years since Adam. The millennium will follow. So people gave away their money. They became nuns. They became monks. They walked the streets. Farmers did not plant any food that last year. Uh, or other people, because people react differently to the end of the world. Others became incredibly wicked, and they got involved in whoremongering, and they said they wanted to go out with a beer stein and a woman in the other hand. So you had complete chaos. There was economic ruin because people were convinced that the end of the world was going to happen. So as we approach the end of the 19th century, you had all the cultists, be it the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the Christians, all of these different groups saying, the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. And you had the psychics and the astrologers saying, the end of the world, the end of the world. And when the year passed and the world didn't end, people said, this thing's a fraud. So you shifted from this spiritualism into materialism. And once again, we landed back in rationalism and cold science. So as you entered the 20th century, Harvard and, and Oxford and your universities turned away from that occultism, occultism. The Society for Psychical Research fell on hard times. And people simply were no longer interested in ghosties and ghoulies and things that went bump in the night. They wanted science. We want facts. 
We don't want to hear any more about this mumbo-jumbo. Until the 1950s, and J.B. Rhine, who grew up in the county north of me, Juniana County in Pennsylvania, raised in a Methodist home. He wanted to be a clergyman, but he went to the University of Chicago, where he was soon turned into a skeptic by his atheistical professor. But in the back of his mind, he kept thinking, why can't we have the mystery of supernaturalism? Why did we have to throw out supernaturalism when we threw out religion? Science is very drab. You realize how boring science is? Ask any high school student. Say, boy, wasn't that an exciting science course, science class. No, it's boring. Test tubes clinking and trying to figure out the calculation. Well, you see, equations and formulas and computers whirling, in the end, does not give us any aura of mystery. It, it takes it away. You're left with nothing. And materialism has always left man devoid of any color. That's why in materialistic societies, if you go to the Soviet Union, what is the predominant color? Gray. Why is everything gray in East Germany? Well, that's the fruit of atheistic humanism. It strips away the bright colors. It takes away mystery. It takes away wonder. It takes away awe. There's nothing left to like. All you are is a combination of cartilage and fat and bone and tissue. You have no soul. There are only electrical impulses going through the circuits of the brain. There is no such thing as God and spirit, life after death. What you see is what you get. You're born, you live, you struggle, and you die. How drab. How boring. And by the 1950s, people were saying, how drab, how boring. And J.B. Rhine happened to attend a lecture by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in which Doyle said, you can have the supernatural without having the religion by using the technique of psychic studies. This absolutely fascinated Rhine. I can make the supernatural scientifically respectable without having to take the Bible and all that religious trapping by declaring it neutral, by saying it is an innate power of man. So really we're only studying man. We're not studying religion. So the universities will be able to have courses in which they deal with the supernatural without being in the, in the religion department. His first task was to rename those topics that would be acceptable. He is the one who developed the term ESP, extrasensory perception. Perception means knowledge of things that come to you outside of the five senses without seeing it, hearing it, tasting it, touching it, etc. Without the five senses knowing something that does not come to you through your body. Now that would be, for example, telepathy, the ability to read the mind. Now he discovered the first case, and, and this indeed was the first case he gave in a university study, the story of the farmer and the horse who could read his mind. And Clem brought out his horse, and he said, my horse can count, read my mind, everything. <clears throat> he said, well, <clears throat> give us a demonstration. He said, okay, Bessie. How much is one plus one? The horse went. <coughs> How much is two plus two? <coughs> and maybe you've seen this on Johnny Carson when the dog runs out and picks out cards that spell somebody's name or, or the bird comes out and do something. Well, well this, in this case, it was a horse. And he wrote this up as a scientific proof of the existence of the neutral human power of telepathy. Of course, someone later on said, hey, you know, let's put a screen between the horse and the farmer. But when they did, when the horse could no longer see the farmer give slight bodily signs and messages, the horse suddenly couldn't count. You could say, Bessie, how much is one plus one? <laughs> That's it. That's it. 
And when it's called coal reading or body reading, so all the farmer has to do, or the circus performer with the dog, <coughs> he just simply has to move his knee. Now, see, animals are much more observant. Their eyes, such as a horse or a dog, are not placed the same way as a man, so they have a greater vision scan. So they're watching the man without you knowing they're really watching him, and the guy's just uh, moving his eyelid, counting, or he's moving his neck or his finger or whatever it is, and they have this on film. It's a trick. Anyone who's an illusionist can do it.